presence of man. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. We're going to talk about discernment. But first I need to sing to you and worship the Lord. And that my prayer right now is that you would understand that what I'm about to sing is the key to obtaining discernment. saying to you the gospel and the gospel is this that if we will bind ourselves to the same tree if we will take our cross up and follow Jesus to Calvary and bind ourselves to that tree we will indeed be set free free indeed and then 
we will have discernment. Then the Holy Spirit will be free to come in and fill us up and give us the wisdom of God and ever-increasing wisdom of God as we walk with the Lord in this world. And so discernment is the title of my message. I'm going to take a moment and pray. Father, we just come before you because we see what you've shown us on the watchman's wall. And because of what we see, we pray, we intercede, we breach the gap between where the church in America is and where you want her to be and where she must be in order to be your witness. Lord Jesus, make your church your witness through this. I have no power of my own to do it, but by the Holy Spirit I will speak as well as possible what I have heard from you. And Father, I give you glory for it. Jesus, have your way. Holy Spirit, do your work, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to a very well-known passage, Matthew 7, starting with verse 13. This passage has been preached many, many, many times. I myself have preached it many times, but it was when I was looking at it when the Lord was preparing me to do this message that I saw that from verse 13 in Matthew 7 on to the end of the chapter, at least to verse 27, is entirely about spiritual discernment. And what is discernment? It's the ability in Christianity, it's the ability to discern truth from error. True teaching, teaching that follows what the Word of God says from erroneous teaching. And in these days of false Christs and false prophets and false teachers, they do abound in these days. We must, we must have spiritual discernment. I'm going to do, I normally don't quote people, but the Lord led me to John MacArthur. And he did a, an article, Discernment, Spiritual Survival for a Church in Crisis. Like me, he sees the church as being in a crisis in America right now. He says this, so many churches have relinquished Bible ethics and doctrine, a deep reverence and worship of God, repentance over sin, humility toward God and fellow believers, and a profound understanding of God's character and work. This is what he sees standing on the wall. This is what I see standing on the wall. There has been a relaxation and a dumbing down and a sweetening in an appropriate way of what the Word of God says. And that has led to an entire nation of undiscipled churchgoers. And we are in crisis because of that, because there is no discernment when we are not being led to full surrender to the Lord. And full surrender means that there's something that must be given up in us, that there's something wrong in us innately that must be changed. Let's go to the scripture now. Matthew 7:13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. I'm going to stop there and talk a little bit. 
I'm asking the Holy Spirit to speak through me. Enter what? Enter life. If you look at verse 14, he's talking about entering life. This is not life as we all exist on this earth, but this is life as God has it, eternal life. Life as God has it here and now and after these bodies fall away and we go to be with God. Life. This is the kind of life that Jesus promises to abundantly give us in John 10.10. 10. Not riches and all those sorts of things, but his life abundantly manifested in us. That's what he's talking about there. The gate is wide. It is flat. It is attractive. There is no need to give anything up. There is no difficulty in going through it. It's a very, very easy place to go to. That's the gate, and the way is wide, and it is very easy to travel. And many, many, many travel on it. And I'm, when I was reading that, I'm saying, Lord, there are 2.16 billion Christians in the world today, according to a survey taken in 2010. 2.16 billion, almost a third of the whole world population. Why, Lord Jesus, do you say so few enter in your way into your life and so many enter this broad path? And I think he means two things. If Christians represent almost one-third of the world, then that means two-thirds that do not know him nor claim his name are certainly on the broad path that leads to destruction. And that destruction is eternal perishing. God so loved the world that he gave his son. If we reject what God has done, that is the penalty. And it is our choice which we make. God doesn't desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The way is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. They enter into destruction rather than entering into the life of Christ. But the other ones, within that approximate one-third that are Christians, there are many who do not follow Christian doctrine at all. They have their own opinions, their treasured opinions, and they're not about to give them up. They're also hearing from false teachers who give them their ear-tickling messages and their warm fuzzies, and there's nothing of the cross in the message, and nothing of the fact that there's something innately in them that only God can fix. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. I had a vision of the narrow gate one time. It was overgrown because so few traveled through it. It was small, it's narrow, it's the path presses in on you as you go through it. That's what that word narrow represents, a pressing in. And that pressing in represents persecution. Persecution and trials. If you look at Paul's life in the Lord, you see that Jesus didn't promise us a rose garden. He promised us that we would be persecuted. He promised us that the world would hate us. 
And dear one, if you call yourself a Christian and the world loves you and you love the world, then you need to do some business with God because you are not his and you do not love him. You cannot love both the world and God. You cannot love both God and mammon. The things of the world, they are passing. Oh my God is eternal. So, this small gate that presses in and is narrow and where you will experience persecution, few find it. Lord, why few? Why few with all those Christians in the world? Why few? Because many start out hearing the message and they rejoice. But then persecution comes. Matthew 13. Then persecution comes. And as in with the parable of the soil that was sown on rocky places, when the sun comes, when the persecution comes, whatever was planted just shrivels up and that one will fall away. And I tell you, oh church, many are falling away because they don't want to experience what Christ says we must. They don't want the cross that they are to bind themselves to. They don't want the world to dislike them. The church in America does everything it can to try to get the world to like them. Every kind of natural draw is attempted. But there's only one thing that can draw a person to repentance and salvation, and that is conviction by the Holy Spirit that they are sinners in need of a savior. We do not, in the church in America, we do not consider that a palatable message. And so sin is not spoken of. The cross is not spoken of in many places. And so few enter life as God has it, eternal life. Few enter. They shrivel up. They go after the ear ticklers. They draw to themselves those who will do and say what they want. I'll just, you don't need to go there, but I'm just going to read for a moment from 2 Timothy 4.3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. And that's what's happening in the church. That's what I'm seeing as I look out. And I tell you this, dear Christian, because God wants you to return to him. He never rebukes, corrects, or judges without having a view to your changing direction. That's the whole purpose of this, is that you would change your direction. We have no discernment. We don't even discern that we're going down the wide path. The narrow one certainly doesn't look like anything we would want to be on in America because it doesn't suit our needs, our wants, our desires. So we don't discern that the way of life is that narrow, pressing in, persecution way. Beware 
verse 15, of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Beware, Jesus warns. There will be false ones who look like you. They're in sheep's clothing. You would think that they were part of your congregation. But truly, they are wolves. And Paul also warns the Ephesians in Acts 20:29 20, that ravenous wolves will come even from among you, even from among you, and they will scatter the flock. We are very scattered in America. There are big churches with many people going to them, but they're really just scattered lambs because the one they're listening to is not God's voice. They cannot discern the voice of Christ. They run after strangers. These are the Lord's words. How do you know who is who? How can you tell? How can you discern who is who? so that you're not following a ravenous wolf who is going to tear you to pieces and destroy you. Know the word of God that you may do his will. Stay away from false teachers, for with their words they kill. Jesus says in 16, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree, the rotten tree, the corrupt tree, bears bad fruit, evil, harmful in effect fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Those who are corrupt in the body of Christ, who are among you as wolves, those who are doing evil, those who are teaching harmful things to you that are going to lead you down the broad path to destruction and perishing. Their ultimate end will be that they will be thrown into the fire. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Never, ever. That is an emphatic no, never, never knew them. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, wickedness, contrary to God's will. Unrighteous sin. Those who practice those things. What is the fruit of a good tree? Doing the will of the Father. What is the fruit of the bad tree? Lawlessness, twisting the word of God to make it ear candy. Using the word of God as a means of gain, monetary gain, notoriety. 
And some of these who are doing these things, dear ones, it's going to be really hard for you to tell who's who unless you know them and can see their daily walk because they're going to be doing miracles and signs and wonders. And they do, even now, in my church, says the Lord. These are false. These are not of God. For not only do they not follow him now, and not only are they sinning, but he never ever knew them. Yet many will follow them down that path. They have no discernment. They don't see, they can't tell the good fruit from the bad, or they never look at the fruit, the life. What kind of fruit of the Spirit is this person manifesting? They never look to see. They never examine. And I'll tell you, if we do, and we find something wrong, and we speak out, we are told we're heresy hunters. We are told to be quiet and not to speak out. But speak out we must. We are watchmen on the wall. I must speak out to you. I must tell you that many of those who are among you are wolves. And many of those who are doing miracles and signs and wonders are wolves. And they are after your soul. And they are after your money. You will see it if you look. But you can't see at all if you don't have eyes. You get spiritual eyes. I'll tell you about that in a bit. You get spiritual eyes from the Lord. Then you can see. Verse 24, he begins to give us a hint. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be compared, in the original Greek here, will be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house, yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who is a doer of the word of God and not merely a hearer, everyone who remembers what he looks like when he gazes into a mirror and turns away. Those who hear only and forget what God is showing them in themselves through this mirror, the word, the moment they turn away, they forget. Those are hearers only and not doers. They do not act on the words of Jesus Christ. They are not building on a rock. But those who act on the words of Jesus Christ, those are building on a rock. And I told you last time that the Lord has said he's bringing a storm to the church that every foundation may be revealed. He's doing this so you may see what you're standing on. So you may see it. And so that you may cry out to him. He is merciful. The hour is not too late for you to turn. And that's what he's asking you to do today. Act on his words. And we'll talk more about his words in a minute. Verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man, a moron, a stupid man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Great has been the fall of the church because so much is built on sand. We must be careful what foundation we build on when we are teaching and when we ourselves are learning. It must be Christ and none other and his words. 
Many preachers will say, God wants you to be rich, but what did Jesus say? Do you remember? Have you read your word? If you have, you'll know. That's contrary to what Jesus said, because he said, Didn't, don't store up worldly treasures. They'll be subject to the moth and rust and decay. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. So the whole prosperity message is a false teaching, dear ones. But you won't know that if you don't know God's word. And so we go from there over to 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. Paul is very concerned about the church at Corinth. That church is very much a reflection of the church in America today. And because I love the church as Paul did and as the Lord does, I also say these words to the church today. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray for the, from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. He's saying, we gave you the gospel, but you're listening to things that aren't the gospel, church at Corinth. Church in America, you're listening to things that are not the gospel and you're accepting them. And you're getting a different spirit and not the spirit of God. And you're getting a different gospel, a different Jesus. Not one who calls you to a cross, but a nice, friendly, non-threatening, soft-spoken, look-alike. Verse 20 of the same chapter, for you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face. He's so concerned for them that he uses these very strong words to tell them, look, you're getting punched in the face by these people who are teaching you false things. You are being enslaved. Jesus came to set you free, and yet you are being enslaved by these who do not talk about a cross you must go to, who do not talk about giving up your life and gaining his, but just talk about you having a better life your life. And many exalt themselves, talk about their great accomplishments without ever mentioning Christ, simply because he was not involved in them. Remember the Chinese underground church member who came to the U.S. was shown all these extremely successful churches in America's eyes. And when asked what impressed him the most, he said, how much you can do without God. A stunning indictment on the church in America and what she sees as success spiritually. I see the Lord showed me two baskets of figs, one rotten and foul and inedible, and one good. Because among the church, there are still good figs. There are still those who are not rotten, who are not teaching things that will rot your soul away. 
but who are pure and who speak God's word. One of them who passed not long ago was David Wilkerson. Another who passed not long ago was Leonard Ravenhill. And I tell you, church, we are in very great trouble. And we must learn discernment. How? How? John 8. Thirty-one and thirty-two. We must know the truth in order to discern. And so Jesus says this to those who had believed him. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth is, O oh church, Jesus calls you to a cross, and when you are bound to that, you are free indeed. Because the thing inside you, which is innate in you, which rebels against God, that dies, and you walk away with a new nature, the divine nature, Christ's nature, and then you become his witness. There must be a crisis time in your life in order for the church to no longer be in crisis. She must recognize that there must be, in each Christian's walk, a crisis, a time, a moment in time, when you climb on that cross and offer yourself. When you do, God will fill you with his nature, his spirit, his love, and then you will be his witness. And that is the only way that it can happen. It's not gradual. Death happens in an instant. There's a time where you are dying leading up to that. There's a time where you are maybe beginning to see that this is something that you must do and that Jesus Christ commands that you do, but there's a moment when you do it. The church is in crisis because they do not teach that there must be a crisis time, a moment where that happens, where you die and he starts living in you. I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's my life verse. It's glorious. This is life. This is Zoe, life as God has it. This is life eternal here and now dwelling within you. This is his abundant life in you. This is what your purpose is here, O oh Christian. You will not know this unless you know this word. You must continue in it. You must abide in it. You must be like a tea bag in hot water and steep in the word of God. Let it get over every tiny little leaf. Absorb this truth or you will certainly be led astray, as many are right now here in America. So you read the word and you learn the truth, and the truth is the cross that you must go to. And then you receive something. Go to 1 John, almost to the book of Revelation. First John two. Verses nineteen and twenty. The Apostle John is dealing here with heresy in the church. 
at the time that he writes this. There is heretical teaching happening that says it's okay to continue keep sin keeping on sinning. You may keep on sinning because that has no effect on your spirit. That was what was being taught at the time he wrote this. And he says this about those teachers. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out. These teachers of this false thing separated from John and the true church that was in Ephesus. I believe that's where this was written from. They went out so that it wouldn't be shown that they're not of us. False teachers. But, 20, here's the key. When you know the truth because you've soaked in the word of God and you know what Jesus is telling you to do, verse 20 happens. And I'm going to read it from the King James because I just think it's a better translation. Gets across in this particular instance, not in every. First John 2.20, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. That's the discernment. Truth from error, divine truth from error, the thing that is lacking in the church, is only available when the Holy One dwells in and reigns in you. And this is what God will very, very quickly do once you see that cross and understand your need to go there. Hallelujah. The unction of the Holy Spirit, his anointing. And it isn't an external anointing. The Lord was showing me King Saul from the Old Testament. And King Saul had an external anointing on him, but that went away. This anointing is not on, but in. In your very innermost being, the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son dwell dwell in you spiritually. You are a child of God, totally given over, totally given over to his will, his ways. And he makes it possible. He gives you the power to live it out. When I told my superintendent in the New England Conference of the Free Methodist Church, Jeff and I were talking with him and we said, this is what we believe, that God can change a human heart and make it pure and fill it with his power and his presence so God literally dwells within us. He said, teach it, preach it, live it. Therefore, the fruit which is seen in us will be good fruit that is good for you. The word of God Dear ones, will lead you to this wonderful place of unction, of power, of manifestation of the Holy Spirit that others may see Christ in you and that you may speak the very words of God, that you may hear him and that you may have eyes, spiritual eyes to see and discern. This way is narrow that I'm calling you to, that I believe the Lord is, I know he's calling you to this. You cannot be a Christian without going in this narrow way. This way involves persecution. There are many who are in churches who don't want anything to do with what I teach. They reject because they are being led by false teachers and don't know the word themselves. They have no discernment. Think of the Jews of the day who even knew the word inside out, the Old Testament, and yet they didn't recognize the one from God standing right in front of them 
because he conflicted with their perception, with their views, with their treasured opinions. They wanted an earthly king who would free them from earthly persecution, who would free them from the oppression of the Romans. This was, this was not at all what Jesus taught. He taught about a spiritual freedom that only he can give. Some will depart from you. It is not an easy path, but it's the way of life. It is the way to life as God has it. And when you have this life, people will not be able to deny that you've been with Jesus. You will have life eternal. So, the Lord's call to you is this. Turn. Cry out to him. Get into this word so you may know the truth. Soak in it. He says, my word will set you free. You will know the truth from this and then I will set you free. He wants to set you free today. You must turn. Turn from the false teachers. Turn from your understanding that sin is okay with God. It is not. He hates sin. He doesn't care if you go to church and sin or if you're in the world and sin. It's the same hatred that he has for it. It is destructive. It is contrary to him and it always causes destruction around us. God's will is that the Holy Spirit dwell in you, in you, fully reigning, so that you may know all things, and he will continue to teach you as you go, so that you may know all things, that's discernment. United, as Christ prayed in John 17. Go there with me. He wants me to be sure to say this to you. Seventeen twenty-five and 26. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known so that, listen, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. That was not true at the time that he prayed this. This is what he was praying for the Father to do when he laid down his life on a cross and died and was buried and rose and ascended. Then he poured out the Holy Spirit, which is how, how we have the same love that God loved his son with in us. God's love, agape, in them, in us. And I, Jesus Christ, I, in them. Jesus Christ, in us. This is God's will. His perfect son prayed this for you, do his will. Do not just hear, but do it. Do not be one that turns away from the truth that I have spoken to you from this word today and forgets what I have said here. Father, your word is powerful. 
Jesus, your words free. Your words free us from all that entangles us so that we may run the race with you. Let many feet be untangled. Let many hearts be opened. Only you can do it. Holy Spirit, convict the church regarding her sinfulness, her desire for ear-tickling messages, her drawing to herself those who will preach such things. When you, Holy Spirit, show us that the way of life is the cross for ourselves. The narrow way. Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father, I call on you to open eyes so that they may discern truth from error. And your church may be, Jesus, the beautiful bride spotless and blameless, and filled with your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan, and pour out his spirit.